welcome to ICTV. Today we have the pleasure of talking to Lon Hodge and his wonderful dog Gander about service dogs to veterans. Uh, he has begun a foundation called Servi the Service Dog Foundation and I'll just let him introduce himself and introduce his dog. Hi, uh, I. This is Ganter. Of course, uh, most people won't remember who I am after the, you know after the the week is over, but uh, they'll remember Gander. Uh, Gander and I currently are uh, traveling through Grand Rapids at the invitation of Mary Corwin, and uh, it's been spectacular. It's been such a wonderful experience. Got to see the Northern Lights last night. We, we've, uh, what, what an incredible place and wonderful people. Oh, thank you. Uh, those of us from the Grand Rapids area, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you come about to get Gander and have him trained? Is if people can't see it, he has a service dog vest on. So tell us how this all came about. We, uh, I, my wife is uh, half Mongolian. We talked about this this morning a little bit. My wife is half Mongolian and, and a, a university professor in China. And uh, I, would, I was living in China with her. I was there almost nine years. And, uh, uh, and having increasing struggles again with with uh, PTSD and anxiety and that kind of thing, and I, and uh, had adopted a neighborhood cat, who who, uh, the Chinese aren't big on animals yet. They really haven't gotten the idea of you know animals as pets, and uh, so I kind of took him under his wing and kind of flabbergasted everybody at what a relationship we had. And I said, wouldn't that be incredible if I had kind of a, a comfort dog or a service dog or something that could help with my arthritis as well as, with PTSD? And I said, I didn't know such a thing existed. So we, we looked it up online, and uh, a group in Denver uh, was on national news. We, uh, I, I gave them a buzz and uh, flew back to the United States for an interview, and uh, then talked to my treatment team at the Veterans Administration Hospital, uh, and they signed all the papers we needed. And then uh, about seven months into the process, which is phenomenally fast, uh, we got the call that uh, there was a dog available. Well, let's let's back up a little bit, Lana, because the audience doesn't know your background. Tell us about your service background. Yeah, we we don't talk so much about the military stuff, but I was in uh, I was in during Vietnam. We um, I worked with uh, I was medical corps at that time, and then later on went to officer candidate school, and uh, and became an ordnance officer and was explosive ordnance disposal trained, bomb squad trained. And uh, so did about eight years in the service uh, with a couple of accidents in between that caused some issues. Uh, and I worked, ironically, I worked in the military uh, working with returning POWs and I worked with, uh, with people with severe combat trauma, uh, the burn center at Brook Army Medical Center, uh, guys who had been in helicopter crashes and that kind of thing and uh, uh, with severe, severe injuries. So, yeah, the great irony was I was doing PTSD counseling for a number of years before it kind of crept back up and bit me. Uh, and PTSD is post-traumatic stress syndrome, correct? Yeah, the, the, yeah, there's a lot of different names for it now. People are calling it just PTS, post-traumatic stress. Other people are calling it PTS, post-traumatic stress syndrome, disorder. A, a lot of people are kind of rejecting the idea of disorder. And, and uh, I, I like the sentiment behind that, you know. Uh, and so when, after you did all of this work with other people in the military who were suffering um, hor horrendous injuries and so forth, what, how did you discover that this was affecting you as well? Uh, it, it came very suddenly, and, and uh, uh, night terrors, nightmares, uh, not wanting to go out in public. I was, I was teaching school, I had just gone through my doctoral program, I was, I was the clinical director for a, for a large hospital, uh, a rehab hospital, and, and working with people with a lot of issues in, uh, and just fell apart. The, the nightmares hit. I was in, in, and I'd be doing, a, I was giving talks all around the country on uh, humor and wellness and how to keep yourself centered and, uh, and it just overtook me. And uh, couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, couldn't go out of the house. I literally was agoraphobic, couldn't, couldn't even get out of the house for months. So then you get the dog. Yeah. And tell us what happened then. Yeah, it was uh, literally, you know, before that I'd been on, on uh, 
which is off the way the VA does it. You know, I was on I was on different medications. You know, with the VA, and uh, they really didn't do a lot of good. Uh, as soon as we got Gander, you know, everything changed. The night terrors were reduced. I was able to go out in public, at least later on, not initially. Gander causes so much attention to come to you, and it was actually more intimidating to go out in public. But uh, night terrors were reduced, nightmares were reduced. Uh, uh, my heart rate went from 120 to 80, back to 80, back to normal again. I, for two years, my heart rate was 120 beats a minute, all day long, every day. Oh, boy. Yeah, it was crazy. So, so how is Gander trained to help you through some of this stressful situations? He was specifically trained. He's, he's trained also to help with, uh, at the time I got Gander, uh, it was required that it be a dual diagnosis of some kind. So I had to have some physical disorder too. So in, in my case, it was, uh, and today's good, but, I, but uh, you know, some severe arthritis issues from time to time. And so he can, he can pick up credit cards, he can open doors, he can turn on lights, he can, uh, uh, he has over 100 tasks that he does and does really well. And uh, he, he'll lean on command, you know, so that if I need just contact, you know, and need to be grounded, he'll lean on command. He'll alert me to noise being too loud, he'll alert me to stress in the area, uh, he'll talk me off the ledge if I'm starting to get upset about something. You know, he does that by getting right in my face. Uh, he uh, does all of that. You know, it's, um, I understand like the turning the lights on and off. Yeah. And um, I, own, I know that people with epilepsy have service dogs that mm. can sense seizures and things like yeah. this. But this, this stress and, and um, um, anxiety, how does, how does Gander know? Do you have to command him, or does he just no, sense no? No, no, he just he just does it. He's uh, in fact he knows before I do, but uh, and, and I know some of it is if he hears my voice elevates, you know, or if there's stress in my voice, he's on it. He's right there with me. Uh, he just seems to know. I mean, we've been places in public where, and he also seems to sense when people are in real emotional distress. I, I, I I'll talk about some of these tonight when we're at the library, but but. Uh, we were in, an example was we were in Denver and there uh, we often go to a place on Capitol Hill in Denver where where a lot of homeless people gather and have coffee at the McDonald's there and stuff and and a homeless fellow sat behind us and Gander much against his training got up and walked over to the guy and laid down on his feet and uh, and I've come to know now that that I'm okay with that where where I think other trainers might get afraid, you know, and, and he's, he's out of control. I, Gander went over laid on his feet and the guy immediately was, looked very nervous and scared and, and I said, are you afraid of dogs? He said, no. He said, he says, is he a medical dog? And I said, yeah. And he says, does he sense when other people are upset? And I said, he can. And I'm, I, I tried just to ease the situation. I said, well, he probably just wanted to cheer you up. And he goes, well, I need cheering up. And I said, why? And he said, well, I was diagnosed with terminal stomach cancer yesterday. And uh, Gander's done that a uh, hundred times, you know. I, and uh, uh, Mark, who's here in the, you know, as the interview goes on, and Mary and others, they've watched this happen. You know, it's uh, I don't have a clue how he does it or how he knows. I've seen him with a a seal who was on his way to South Africa on a mission who had started having panic attacks the night before his flight was supposed to take off. I didn't know this. Um, he had come in the door and this big bruising bald-headed guy came up and Gander again went right up to him, leaned against him and the guy leaned over and started to cry and he said, how did, how did this dog know? And I said, he just knows, you know, yeah. You know that uh, just animals are smarter than we think they are, I yeah. think, yes. Yeah. So what kind of a dog is Gander? Well, we didn't know at first. He was, uh, Gander was a rescue. Um, this particular agency, the prison system gets the dogs, uh, they rescue them and they train them in basic obedience. And then they, so it makes them, they can send them back to the shelters and they're more adoptable. Then they take the better dogs and then they go on to be evaluated by, in this case, Freedom Service Dogs. And uh, uh, 
so we didn't know what he was. He'd been through this long, arduous process from the kill shelter. So I did his DNA. He's a Labradoodle. Yeah. That's, I was, was going to guess that yeah. because we have yeah. one next door to us. And he Labradoodle. So yeah, yeah. But, but the dogs at Freedom, they could be anything, you know. They're but this, this Freedom dogs that, that you got Gander from, um, they, they use all rescue dogs? All rescue dogs. Yeah, it's 100% rescue dogs. And all of them have been initially through the prison system at some point. So. Oh, and what does the prison system do? The prison system has a program in the, in this particular case, it was in a maximum security prison in uh, Canyon City, Colorado, and uh, in, in a women's prison. And Gander had been with a, a prisoner who uh, was in the last leg of, I think, a four-year sentence. And uh, they, they use it for you know two ways. They actually train the the inmates how to work with the dogs, and so that gives them a skill set when they get out. And then also freedom hires some of the prisoners when they get out, and uh, and then it also it also gives them you know a reason to kind of get up in the morning and do things and to and to be on their best behavior while they're in prison because these dogs mean a lot to them. They actually stay with them in the cells. It's tremendous. What do you think started that? I mean that sounds like a such a a hu humane way to both treat the prisoners and the dogs. I wonder how that ever got started. Yeah, I don't know. I've I've called it the you know I call it the triple rescue. You know, it's uh, you rescue the prisoners and then you rescue the uh, you rescue the dog and then you rescue the you know the people that that get these dogs afterwards. You know, and it's a uh, it's powerful stuff. Now, uh, are these dogs specifically trained for PTSD or for other disabilities? Or no, this this particular agency does. It's about a 50-50 program. Half go to veterans, and the other half go to people with uh, more severe physical disabilities. I think in my class, uh, my graduating class, when we, we you go for three weeks and actually train with a dog, and there were there was a, a young boy with autism. His mother was there learning all the basics with the dog. Uh, there was a, a fellow with um, uh, MS. There was, uh, and there were three veterans. Two of them who'd been in multiple uh, uh, IED attacks and uh, and been injured. Uh, me and uh, and a couple others. It, it it was a real mix of people. Yeah. You know. So so the like you said earlier, the PTSD has to be uh, joined with another. Diagnosis to get a dog is that still the case? I, you know, I'll have to check because I really don't know. I know there's some agencies now. You know, in the last four years, because there's such a demand, so many guys coming back from Afghanistan, and and so many guys now kind of waking up from Iraq, and and uh, and now a lot of guys beginning to understand uh, who've been through Vietnam, beginning to understand why they're having all these problems they're having, are now beginning to look for dogs. And a lot of agencies have sprung up all over the country for that. So there are agencies that do just PTSD, and, uh, and then other agencies that do the, uh, that do dual diagnosis dogs. So um, what, what do you say to people who say, what can we do? Because there will be people in our ICTV audience that'll say, how can we help? How can we support this? You know, uh, one of the ways I, I think I think our prime mission, you know, in life is to educate people about uh, my concern. My concern is one people people with trauma, you know, helping them feel safe and secure in society again. Sexual trauma victims, war trauma victims, you know, people who've been in accidents or people who, that have congenital disorders that have caused them like severe stress through their life, and so part of that is 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 learning as much as you can about service dogs, not engaging service dogs when they're in public um, uh, without, without permission, not talking to the handler and asking him, why do you have this dog? You know, I think one yeah. of the standard lines for me is always is, you know, like, so why do you have a dog? You don't look like you need a dog. And I said, that's because I have a dog. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and being good to the handlers, treating this animal like he's a, a piece of medical equipment. And, uh, and you wouldn't ask somebody why they've got a wheelchair. You wouldn't ask them why they've got a cane. And, and the other part is, is look, for, look for groups where you can devote some time and talent and some energy. And uh, for us, we do some things called uh, Planned Acts of Community Kindness on our wall. And it's Gander's Wall. If you go to Facebook and you type in Gander, uh, Gander Mountain will come up and then Gander Service Dog will come up. 
And uh, we don't ask people for money. We don't do those kind of things. But we do ask you to participate in acts of kindness from time to time, where we ask you to send cards to veterans or ask you to support us on a trip where we're going to go visit someone who has no family who's been in a nursing home for years or, or someone who's just gone through an amputation who doesn't have family support or, or whatever that is uh, or for us to go to a, one of the great one of the great ones recently was a, a woman who had never met her grandfather who was uh, had been buried in San Francisco. She found out through Freedom of Information Act. Uh, her mom had been, it, it was a war baby kind of situation from World War II. And, uh, and they just wanted flowers laid on the grave. And so we put it up on Gander's wall and there were flowers there within 15 minutes. You know, it's really magical stuff. So a little stuff. acts of kind pay of. it forward yeah, type of thing. So how do you travel with him, by the way? Can you fly on an airplane with him? Gander can go anywhere. He's uh, legally can go anywhere, but neither one of us are really thrilled about airplanes. Uh, airplanes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so we travel a lot on Amtrak, and Amtrak's been, you know, really good to us. Um, we wish they hadn't become so expensive, but so we we got a little trailer recently. You know, we we like I say, we don't ask for donations, but a small group of of people on Gander's Wall did their own act of kindness, and and they provided us with a trailer that we take around the country with us now. Uh, for what we call Operation Fetch, and uh, it's another book that we're doing. And uh, so mostly in the car, mostly by train, and, uh, you know, we kind of go where anybody asks us to show up. Now, you mentioned a book. Have you written a book? Is this the case? Yeah, I've, I've been a writer most of my life. We put together a, an anthology of dog stories called In Dogs We Trust, and it, they're by top writers from all over the country. Um, uh, the guy who trains all the dogs and for the dog seals. And dog is God and spelled backwards. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the guy who trains all the dogs for the seals. Um, the original dog whisperer is in there. There's a lot of great, wonderful short stories, and uh, and so we use that to you know we'll sell those at readings when we go places to kind of defer costs. Do you, uh, uh, is your book on Amazon or in it, local bookstores? It's, or? it's in e-format on Amazon, and okay. right now we're hoping to be able to set aside enough money to go ahead and uh, and get it properly published in, in, in into all the stores. We did it in limited edition because we just wanted it for you know Gander's friends, and then uh, but it became a little more popular than that. So now we're you know we're looking at at ways to get it back out into the general public. How long have you had Gander? Uh, exactly. This is our our second anniversary together today. So Twenty. Yeah. Wow. So we, we we're together twenty four seven. So. How old do you think he is? The best guess is uh, four years old, and uh, we celebrate. Uh, Gander, strangely enough, was born in the same city I was, in Pueblo, Colorado, and so uh, so we celebrate our birthday on the same day, October twelfth. So. <laughs> So you, you've got a birthday coming up pretty soon, Gander. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything you can show us that your dog d does? Is that, uh, uh, I would think maybe our audience would like to see some of the things that Gander is capable of doing, at least commands or? Stay. No, he said. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing that quite well. Yeah, isn't that great? Isn't yeah. he wonderful? It's incredible. Yeah. Gander, I don't know. You want to show off? Can you sit up? Gander, how are you? Can you sit? He's like, <laughs> he's, he thought he was at work, you know, so he's like, can you, can you stand up? Let's watch. Gander, stand up for a second, please. Gander, come here. Stand up. Ah, Say. see, you're going to embarrass me because this is generally when he knows we're engaged in conversation or we go to a restaurant, he's taught to go underneath the table right away in the restaurant and he'll lock down. So and it means he knows where he's he is a, today. He's yeah. supposed to be quiet, and it's the same thing here. He knows I'm. Uh, he knows we're engaged in a conversation, so he wants to make himself as as unobtrusive as possible, and that's why I, I've actually had waiters and waitresses give me the check and then and then go down to pick something up and go, oh my God, I didn't know there was a dog in there, <laughs> and and that's that's how you know a real service dog from from not too. You yeah. Know, you, He's not supposed to be there. You know, he's not supposed to be visible to the public. You're not a small dog, so you're not quite invisible, Gander. Yeah. I, so, Gander, can you sit? Come here. Come here for a sec. Come up here. Stand up. Let's go. You ready? Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. It's okay. Come on. It's okay. Stand up. Can you do me a favor? Can oh, can you take that? I have to warm in, warm oh, myself I'm into it here. A bit, so. yeah. Can you take that for me? Take.
Thank you. So he has the softest mouth in the world. You know, he can pick up credit cards. He can, uh, he'll do that with keys or any, anything I draw. If he knows it's real, yeah. he picks it up right away, and he loves to do it. And uh, he's, now he, he opens handicap doors with his feet, but he also can do it with his nose. Can you touch? Can you touch? He'll do it with his nose. And uh, he'll also jump to turn on lights with his nose. And can you have a seat? And he does everything either by, he does it by hand command, sit, or he does hand commands, or he does uh, voice commands. Can you have a seat? All right, down. Okay, can you sit back up for a sec? Sit. Thanks. Can you stay right there for a sec? Give me five, big dog. Thanks. Uh -huh. So. But we Does don't do bark? tricks with him. No, he's not allowed to bark. He'll, well, that's uh, wonderful. <laughs> now, uh, he will bark at me. I'm the only one he ever barks at, and that's okay. if he's frustrated because I have a ball and I won't give it up. Ah. <laughs> but uh, he's he doesn't bark in public. We were at, uh, and he won't do anything, uh, you know, without without consent. I could put food here, and he'd never touch it. Uh, we were just at Fenway Park. One of our acts of kindness was to help reunite a a Marine from Afghanistan with his uh, military working dog. And uh, Gander actually was off leash at Fenway Park the whole time and we went down we went down for batting practice right down on the field and Gander watched every ball that got hit but he didn't, uh, <laughs> but he was really good. Good, he didn't go after those balls no, that he. It, and that's his, that may be his second love in life is. Is a ball, you're, a ball. you're number one and the ball is number two. Yeah. Well, it has been a delight to talk to you, Lana, you and also to see you again. Are you a bit of delight? He's amazing. We've had the opportunity today to speak to Lon Hodge. Uh, Lon and his dog, Gander, have been crisscrossing the country doing acts of kindness for other military veterans and other people in need. Um, and you can follow Gander on Facebook, correct? Yes. If you just type in Gander on your uh, Facebook search, you'll find Gander and you can follow him and follow some of his adventures with, with Lon, and he is Lon's 24-7 companion, and everybody here in the studio would like to take him home as well. Yeah, and you, if he'll go with you, you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for watching. My name is Mary Kay Jacobson. I've been your host today on ICTV. Thanks for watching.